They wouldn't visit their grandparents, and they wouldn't spread it to their neighbors and, or friends. That's the difference testing and screening can make. And I'm here at Humber River Hospital today to provide an update on the rollout of the rapid testing. My friends, the new rapid tests are game changers. These new tests can turn around test results in minutes instead of days. In fact, the Abbott ID Now and the Pan Bio tests can turn around results in under 20 minutes. And we've been getting these tests as quickly as we can to the front lines of our healthcare system. I have one of these Abbott tests right here in my hand. These tests right here, folks, are a game changer. I'm here with Daniel St. Pierre from Abbott Rapid Diagnostics to personally deliver some of these rapid test kits. I want to thank Daniel and his team and some of the brightest minds in the entire world for developing these innovative tests. This kit in my hands is one of 1.2 million pan bio tests and 98,000 ID now rapid tests that we received through the federal government. And more shipments are on their way. Humber River is one of 22 hospitals that will be receiving these test kits in the coming weeks. We're also sending these test kits to rural and remote communities where they'll help us cut down the turnaround times. And we'll also use these tests to conduct early investigations into outbreaks in hotspot regions. These new rapid tests will reinforce the ro robust testing strategy we have in place. A testing strategy that currently leads the country with over 5.8 million tests completed to date. More importantly, we will make sure that these rapid tests add an extra layer of, of defense in protecting our most vulnerable citizens. We've already deployed these tests in 36 long-term care homes and 27 retirement homes. The pan bio test will also be used in a screening program for our long-term care homes. Over the next few weeks, dozens of our long-term care homes will use these tests to test staff and visitors to keep our long-term care residents safe while ensuring essential caregivers can continue the, uh, to visit and worry less about endangering their loved ones. My friends, with the numbers where they are, testing is crucial. And anyone who needs a test will be able to get a test. We have over 150 pharmacies now offering testing and 174 assessment centers across the province. That's 350, uh, 324 locations that you can go get a test. My friends, we have the tools. We have the talent. We've done it before. And if we all do our part, we can get through this together. Thank you, and God bless the people of Ontario. Now I'll pass it over to Minister Elliott. Thank you, Premier, and good afternoon. Ontario has continued to be a national leader in testing. This is in large part due to the tireless efforts of our heroic lab technicians, pharmacists, nurses, and other frontline staff. Thank you. As part of our fall preparedness plan, we committed to expanding our testing capacity and options for all Ontarians. In support of this, our government is proud to have strongly advocated for the approval of rapid tests. These tests will help provide timely access to testing in regions with high transmission, as well as rural and remote regions with high turnaround times. As part of our partnership with the federal government, Ontario has received 98,000 ID now and 1.2 million pan bio tests, and is expecting to receive up to 1.5 million more pan bio tests by the end of December. ID now will initially be used in hospitals and assessment centers in rural and remote communities. It will also be used to test people as part of early outbreak investigations across the province, including in hotspot regions such as Toronto and Peel, where there are high concentrations of COVID-19 cases. Two hospitals are already using ID now, with 20 other hospitals about to launch rapid testing, including right here at Humber River Hospital. Continued rollout of ID now is planned in Toronto and Peel and work is underway with Ontario Health and local public health units to support rapid testing deployment across the province. PanBio will initially be used to support a screening program for long-term care homes. 
To date, PAN BioTests have been deployed to six long-term care home operators for potential deployment in over 30 homes, 27 retirement homes, eight hospitals, and 11 industry partners such as Ontario Power Generation, Air Canada, and Magna, with plans to expand further across the province. These tests will also be used in a broader eight-week pilot over a five-month period for interested employers in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. This pilot program is an important opportunity to learn about the value of antigen screening for asymptomatic workers in a range of workplace settings and will inform future decisions about safely and fully reopening the economy. As both ID Now and Pan Bio tests are new, they will be carefully evaluated. However, we are confident these tests will provide Ontarians with more access to innovative testing options and will help to quickly identify and manage outbreaks to stop the spread of COVID-19. Our government will continue to work with our system partners to expand testing capacity and evaluate new and emerging technologies and quality testing options. This is critical if we are to stop the spread of COVID-19 during the second wave and any future waves. We will continue to ensure that anyone who needs a test can get a test. If you have COVID-19 symptoms, please get tested at an assessment centre and please continue to follow the public health guidelines. This added capacity will ensure we are able to track, trace and isolate COVID-19 through the second wave and beyond and help ensure our frontline heroes, the people they care for and the general public stay safe. Thank you. We'll go to the phones for questions. First question, please. First question comes from Cynthia Mulligan at City News. Please go ahead. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, Premier. Hi. Uh, this is my question for you today. I've been looking at the school data, and I find in the two areas, Toronto and Peel, in lockdown, the numbers are, not surprisingly, much higher than the rest of the province. Yeah. But in Toronto, in public schools, one in three schools has an active case of COVID. The number is even higher. It's 40% of Toronto Catholic schools have an active case as of today. Mm -hmm. We're also looking at the Peel numbers, and they're very high in Brampton as well. Has your government been downplaying the, the situation in schools. I know you have said repeatedly that it is a priority to keep them open, but I think many parents would be startled by these numbers. Yeah, but I'd never downplay anything, Cynthia. Anything I, I know, I tell the people the, the next day, numbers don't lie, they're out there. And uh, I'm just transparent when I come up here. I was told before I walked through the, the doors today that still 99.9% .9 of all teachers are uh, COVID free and I think it was 99.2% uh, of the percent of the, the students are uh, COVID free but that doesn't uh, downplay anything. We need to continuously uh, focus on the education system and along with the educators and uh, anything they need. If we have to increase the, the testing, we'll increase the, the testing and again what I think is a, a game changer uh, are these uh, pan bio tests. But I'm going to pass this over to the, the Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, the decisions that we made with respect to uh, putting Toronto and Peel in lockdown were based on the pretty staggering increases in numbers. However, one of the central tenets of our, our fall preparedness plan is keeping essential services open uh, and making sure that people can have access to food and medicines and so on. But also, it's been important to keep children in school. And we do have a very rigorous plan that was put together by the Minister of Education with the assistance of our Chief Medical Officer of Health and other public health officers to make sure that children will be safe in schools because we've heard from from many experts in child care, child uh, development, uh, that it is very important for both children's uh, physical health uh, that they uh, continue on in school, but also for their mental health, that they need to continue with their school activities. They're being safely cohorted. They are being, uh, there are rigorous protocols that have been put in place to keep them safe. And so that is something that we are continuing with. If the circumstances change and the, uh, there's a huge increase in the number of cases at school, 
schools, we might have to take another look at it. But it's a very rigorous plan that's been put in case to keep our children safe in schools. Follow up? Um, this is for both of you, I suppose. We know that a lot of younger children are asymptomatic. So how do you know that it's not much more widespread in the schools and they aren't taking it home and then out to the greater community? Uh, we know that there's you know, a, a great difficulty in contact tracing all of these cases. So how do you know that these young asymptomatic kids aren't already spreading it even further? And why wouldn't you do more rigorous testing in the schools? I've asked repeatedly about that, and I'm constantly told it's not necessary. But when you have one in three Toronto public schools with an active case today, is that not setting off alarm bells? Yeah, it definitely sets off alarm bells. Uh, Cynthia, the best person to answer this is the Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, we have put over a billion dollars in increasing our uh, testing strategy, our case and contact management, making sure that we have more people on the ground and in our communities that are be able to, uh, to do that contact tracing to find out where some of these cases are coming from and how they're spreading. The uh, contact management has been increased by over 200 officers in the City of Toronto and by well over 100 in Peel as well, with some public health units from other areas being able to uh, assist as well where they don't have high levels of COVID-19. They're providing the assistance by telephone for case and contact management. So we have put the resources in there, but thus far we have not seen a huge community spread from children in schools. In most cases, it's been the other way around. The children have uh, obtained COVID from other locations, from parents or from other places that they may have been within the public. Next question. Next question comes from Mike Crawley at CBC News. Please go ahead. How are you doing, Mike? Hi, a uh, question for uh, Minister Elliott. Uh, mm -hmm. Tomorrow, the Auditor General is going to be uh, reporting on the province's uh, COVID response, in particular, uh, looking at the lab testing system uh, and uh, contact tracing and uh, how the Health Ministry uh, managed uh, that overall. Um, I know that the government always sees uh, the auditor's report and has an opportunity to respond um, in, in writing to the auditor's report before it's actually made public. So uh, how, um, how critical is this uh, uh, report going to be? Well, we always appreciate the reports that the Auditor General provides. She has uh, significant knowledge and experience. And if there are uh, lessons that we can learn that we can apply to the second wave of COVID, uh, that would be great. And so we, uh, I haven't had a chance to have a full briefing as yet. I am speaking with the Auditor General later this afternoon to understand some of the specific items she wishes to bring forward. But uh, I look forward to a, a, a full discussion with her. and. Uh, I understand that uh, she is going to be, as you've said, bring forward, bringing forward her report to the public tomorrow. So I uh, am going to uh, uh, hold any further comments until I've actually had a chance to have a complete review of her report. Thank you. Follow up. Uh, and then a question for the Premier from my uh, colleagues in Ottawa. Uh, the Integrity Commissioner in Ottawa has now found uh, twice that the City Councillor Rick Chiarelli uh, violated the Code of Conduct there by committing uh, incomprehensible incidents of harassment uh, is what the integrity commissioner said uh, but under the provincial law the councillor can't be removed from office uh, so premier wondering if uh, you would support changing uh, the municipal act that would allow for the removal of an elected official in the case of uh, egregious uh, behavior yeah what i'd like to do mike is uh, talk to the uh, mayor mayor watson out there and get all the the details before i answer that and uh, we'll, we'll review it, but I'll make a call to Mayor Watson today and uh, get a, a quick uh, briefing on it. Next question. Next question comes from Lucas Meyer at News Talk 1010. How you doing, Please Lucas? Thank you very much. Uh, first question to Premier Ford about the situation at the Adamson Barbecue. Are you angry to hear that bylaw officers are not ticketing people inside eating at this restaurant today? Well, they have to follow the rules. There, there can't be rules for one group and, and not the other. And I, I just wish that they'd just follow the rules. I, I can't get angry at any business person. They're hurting right now and they're struggling and they're doing everything they can to stay afloat. But, you know, if we if we let everyone open, we're, we're going to be in worse shape. You're, you'll be asking me different questions in, in a few weeks. 
um, if everyone just continues to open up and ignore the the uh, guidelines laid out by the chief medical officer. So I'm just asking people, please follow the guidelines. And the quicker we can get these numbers down, the quicker uh, restaurants can open up, and the quicker we can get the vaccine distributed, quicker businesses can go back to normal. And and again, I think this these pan bio tests are, are a game changer. Uh, the more we have, the more we're going to get out into the field. And as Cynthia asked uh, earlier on, you know, if the numbers do escalate, maybe that's that's an option. I'd sit down with the Minister of Education too. So as long as we get the supply, we'll we'll get them out there. Um, we're we're doing an extremely good job on on the uh, testing. I think it was 48,000 the other day. Follow up. And because this came up in question period today, Premier, and we have some new numbers that we're seeing around just how many tests we have. We know that a shipment of 100,000 first came in about a month ago. Yeah. So because you, you, you seem to have some details there, can you just say when exactly after you received the first shipment of rapid tests, um, when were the very first shipments deployed to long-term care uh, and to yep. these retirement homes, the 30 reti uh, long-term care homes, 27 retirement homes? When exactly were the first shipments sent out, and exactly do you know how many have already been deployed? What I can do, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I can get back to you, but I, I'm glad that Health Canada, because I was up here jumping and screaming for two months to get these done, so I want to thank Health Canada for getting these in, and then once it gets in, put them in the D distribution center and we allocate it to the most vulnerable areas uh, throughout Ontario, no matter if it's the northern rural areas or the uh, long-term care homes. And uh, we, we got the logistics down pat. They're out there as we speak right now. People are using them as we speak right now. And the more that come in, the more we're going to get uh, throughout the system. As, as the uh, minister uh, mentioned, we, we have them in uh, hospitals right now. We have them in long-term care centers. Uh, across the uh, or the region, I'll, I'll pass it to the Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, we have uh, moved these tests out as quickly as possible, making sure that we do the necessary uh, uh, examination of the ones that have been received, making sure that they're ready to go, then uh, making sure that we have the right allocations going to the right places. But as the Premier indicated, they have been shipped and they are actually being used at the uh, Ottawa Hospital and at Soldiers Memorial Hospital and very soon here at Humber Hospital as well. So we uh, did not waste any time moving forward with them because we know that they are badly needed uh, in hospitals and long-term care homes that where we need to have a faster response and in some of our um, more northern, more isolated communities where it takes a longer period of time in having to ship some of the uh, specimens to the labs to be read. So we have sent them up to the places that need them most. And when we get the next shipment from the federal government, we'll continue to, uh, to uh, ship them to other locations as well. Next question. Next question comes from Jason Chapman at 640 Toronto. Please go ahead. Hi, Jason. Thanks for taking time for the question. Thank you. Um, I want to read a tweet that Dan Kelly from the CFIB put out yep. this morning. It says, day two of Toronto Peel lockdowns. Joe Fresh still open, independent clothing boutique closed. Flowers at Walmart, no problem, independent florist closed. Books at Costco, come on in, independent bookseller closed. And just based on your answer to Lucas about what's happening at the uh, Addison Barbecue, uh, I think Dan Kelly wants to know what's fair out there. Uh, and I'm curious, do you think that you will stand by the rules laid out for the lockdown for the full 28 days or will tweaks be made? Well, I, I, this this is so fluid. This moves so quickly. Uh, I, I can't answer 28 days down the road. They're reviewing it every single week. And uh, I'll be very frank, it's not fair. A lot of these things aren't fair. And you sit there and I, I can justify an argument on both both sides. But that's what the, the health team put in front of us. And I have to take their advice and we, we move forward on it. But is is this fair? And CFIB, are they wrong? No, they aren't wrong. It's It's not fair. But how do you square that? Do you, do you shut down every single second aisle at a Walmart or a Costco? It's just not realistic. It, it just isn't, guys. You know, and it, it, I, I, I'm not disagreeing with you, believe me. It's uh, frustrating. As I say, right, the, the toughest thing in this whole job that, that I feel I, as, a, as a business owner, I, I hate closing down businesses, you know, and I, I just, I hate it. That's, a, that's what I can tell you. But I'll always follow... The, the medical advice and the, the health advice. But I, I've always said too, and, and uh, 
you know, someone put this out on a, on a tweet, I think it was Warren Casella, but I, I said this uh, months ago, you, you know, it always really concerns me when economists uh, try to give me health advice and when health experts try to give me uh, economic advice. Uh, things, things don't work out that well. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything I can to support the businesses. We put another $300 million forward. Uh, to support the businesses. We're paying 90% of their rent with, with uh, support from the federal government, 65% of their, their wages, paying their, their taxes, the property taxes, the electricity cost, uh, online assistance. Uh, I could rattle them all off. We're, we're, we're throwing everything we can uh, to support uh, the, the small businesses. Uh, believe me, if there's anything frustrating, that, that's what frustrates me the most, is watching uh, small businesses uh, struggle. Uh, but again, this, this right here could be a game changer. It's, it's, you know, it's a screening device. And I say screening, it's 93.3% accurate. It's not 100% accurate, but at least it screens people. 93% uh, accurate, and then we can go to the PCR test in, in full if someone screens uh, positive. So I, I hear you. I, I do. But uh, we're doing everything we can to support our, our small businesses. And I just want to get through this as quickly as possible. And with the announcement of the vaccine coming, uh, I, I just, you know, it couldn't come soon enough, put it that way. Follow up? If I could, just a clarity first, and I have another question. Sure. Could you see small Main Street shops and reopening before the 20 days are up for a year? Or no? I, I wish, no you know out. something, I wish I could tell you 20 days down the road. If you asked me 20 days ago, would we be in this position or 20 days before that? It, it's just moving rapidly. Uh, if everyone follows the protocols and guidelines, I truly believe uh, the, the numbers uh, should start coming down. And uh, the resources, be it the pan bio test or other areas that we can continue focusing on testing and catching these cases early, uh, that, that's, that's the name of the game here. And we're, we're doing it. We're leading the country by far. Uh, more than all the provinces combined, we're doing more, more testing. And so we aren't going to slow down on that. But we're going to continue supporting our small business uh, uh, folks out there. Last question. Last question comes from Rob Ferguson at the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Hi, Rob. Hi, Premier. I just want to go back to the Adamson barbecue yeah. situation. Um, he was pretty openly defiant last night on a, on a video post on social media about uh, um, what he was going to do today, open up that 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 shop for or the restaurant for, for in-person dining. In the past, you've talked of, of people, um, you know, partying in, uh, in uh, houses or, you know, storage units that the cheese has slipped off their cracker and, mm -hmm. and, and, and how dangerous they are and whatnot. I, I'm not hearing that from today, and I'm wondering why the change in tone, given that, well, you know, police didn't go in and pull anybody out of that restaurant. They said they didn't have the resources. And um, we don't know yet if charges are going to be laid against this business owner. And, wh and what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I, you know, something when it comes to private parties, you know, that, that's, that's a different uh, ball, ball of wax there. But the, I just want the guy to shut down. I'm not going to get up here and start pounding a small business owner when the guy's holding on by his fingernails. There's a, you know, I differentiate be between someone at home being reckless and having a hundred people over and partying or renting a, a, a you know public storage place. That that's reckless, and uh, I don't condone it. I don't condone that he opened up, but you know, I I feel terrible. My heart breaks for these guys, and it's not fair. But please, in saying all that, you gotta follow the protocols and the guidelines. That that's what it comes down to, because if everyone does that, you know, what he does. You know, again, as I was saying earlier, uh, Rob, like you're going to be asking me another question uh, when we hit 2,000, 3,000, uh, you know, cases a day. Uh, that's the last thing we, we want to uh, happen. So if everyone just follows the protocols, we'll, we'll get through this as soon as possible. And it, it's, we're throwing everything, everything. If I, every tool I have, I'm throwing at this, this COVID. I'm not holding back on anything, not holding back on on the money side, not holding back on anything and all the resources we're, we're throwing at it. But my heart breaks for these guys, these business owners, believe me. Follow up. Thanks, Premier. I'm going to change gears a little bit and, and get to these rapid testing kits. Um, I, I'm curious uh, to get maybe a bit more, uh, a bit more detail. 
on how they're going to be deployed in, in hot spots, say, uh, you know, northwest Toronto or anywhere else, you know, Scott, or anywhere else that, feel that, that cases are, are really popping up in neighborhoods. I don't know if, if uh, Mr. Elliott wants to take yep. this one, but yep. just how do you go in there? Do you, do you take uh, public health people and they, they go from home to home with these things? Apartment buildings, how is that going to work? Yeah, I'll pass it to the minister. Thank you. Well, we do have um, pop-up units, mobile testing units that we're sending into some of these hotspot neighborhoods and encouraging people to come out. But we're also working with some of our community partners out there, uh, the local community health centers who have been serving people's needs for many years, where they already have a, a trusting relationship. They know each other very well. And so uh, we're working with those centers to help bring people in to be tested there. This is going to serve two purposes. First of all, for the, for the fast testing that we're doing for COVID now, but then when the vaccine becomes available, they will also feel comfortable coming to those places as well because they have that type of relationship with the people in the health centers and people will therefore come in and, and know that it's for a good purpose and that they can receive the vaccine there. So we really want to work with um, organizations that already exist in these hotspot communities to help for both the testing and uh, for the COVID vaccine in the future. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you, everyone.